Hello there. I wanted to uh, say a little bit more about breathing exercises. Last week I had explained that the breath should never be changed and that breathing exercises really relate to something much more subtle. Pushing and pulling, straining, counting, holding the breath. These are all very brute force and crude methods of working with breathing. Now certainly they have an effect. So does banging your head against a wall. The human world is full of um, ideas like that. That have an effect but really are not what you're looking for. There are many things you can do when people make money off them. They gain reputations. I imagine that if you made unicorn shaped cookies you could find people who claim that they saved their lives all this stuff has to be pushed away now let me clarify my comments about the breathing breathing is one of the lowest level experiences we have it's really fundamental it's deep it's deeper than the three centers it's before that it's a very very low experience when the universe breathes the beings in that universe experience this movement of the vital force we experience that as breathing but underneath the breathing is the movement of the vital force it is a very very low level contact with the source and it's our road home the breath is our road home and you're wise if you choose your exciting adventures and your debauchery you can do whatever you like as long as you keep the lifeboat clean and the lifeboat is the breath and that's why you should not change the breath and once you change the breath how are you going to get home I mean you may literally die because of that because you have no way to actually return home in the same way that Gurdjieff says that conscience is still available in the solar plexus I would say the breath is a different route home in some ways more fundamental because conscience is about what you're doing the breath is even deeper than that it's even deeper so that's why one should not change the breath and that breathing exercises have to be understood at a much more subtle level now, I've um, been reading this very interesting book by Ferdinand Ozendowski it's called Beasts, Gods and Men and it's about his flight from Russia during the revolution about 1920 when communists were taking over and he fled Russia through the forests into Siberia he was planning to get to the Far East Um, Although when he emerged from the border of Russia, he found that Russian troops, communist Russian troops, had made deals with the Chinese and the Mongolians were involved and he redirected himself to try and escape through India. So it's an epic, true story and it has a lot of esoteric information in it, visions and warnings and all sorts of things. Probably because if you're in the dark forest, far away from anything, you start to realize that nature is alive and there are things that live there. Things that you would be hard pressed to feel in this world of human misery and human
the attack on reality that is what human life is. Today in Brighton, what's in the UK on the south coast, there's a big marathon and everybody's standing by the roadside, clapping and sort of reinforcing this collective herd-like behaviour because nobody wants to be anything apart from the herd. They, they have lost interest in anything else apart from being in a herd. Gurdjieff said that human beings were being overtaken by slugs. <laughs> they no longer lived like three-brained beings and often not like two-brained beings. They were degenerating to the level of small animals or insects or something like a herd, a hive and the pressure from them is very very strong very little is going to survive it's like a, a great storm the deafening noise of the herd stampeding and you do have to have special qualities to be able to not only survive but maintain your individuality and your reality before it's all blown away and recently as the conditions of life in the UK and perhaps everywhere else have really started to degenerate um, I see again and again the need to have a simple hard and straight path we're nothing fancy we don't live in a fancy world anymore Things are sliding, people are sliding. I think it's the internet and mobile phones are just completely robbing people of any sense of themselves. They no longer exist. They live in a, a ghost life where any thought, any, anything individual is immediately eradicated by their little device or the collective baying just overwhelms them and takes it away and there's just nothing left. Um, and as a result, society starting to be remodeled. It's all crazy. Well, here I'm going to read something from this book, Beasts, Men and Gods, that is from a different world. A world that is remote from the noise of people. A world of a physical existence, tough people living in nature, hunting, it mentions the wolves circling at night in the deserts of Mongolia, how dangerous the animals were and the people too. So that's a world very far away from where we live today in the West. So um, this particular episode concerns the Tushigun Lama, who is a man of great power, who appears to Ferdinand Ossidowski along his travels. And they spend a couple of evenings in mutual company in a tent in the desert, keeping warm and exchanging stories. So I will, I will begin the story. Without the walls of the yurta, the wind whistled and roared and drove the frozen snow sharply against the stretched felt. Through the roar of the wind came the sound of many voices and mingled shouting, wailing and laughter. I felt that in such surroundings it were not difficult to dumbfound a wandering nomad with miracles, because nature herself had prepared the setting for it. This thought had scarcely time to flash through my mind before Tushigun Lama suddenly raised his head, looked sharply at me and said, There is very much unknown in nature, and the skill of using the unknown produces the miracle, but the power is given to few. I want to prove it to you, and you may tell me afterwards whether you have seen it before or not. He stood up, pushed back the sleeves of his yellow garment, seized his knife and strode across to the shepherd. Michik, stand up, he ordered. 
When the shepherd had risen, the llama quickly unbuttoned his coat and bared the man's chest. I could not yet understand what was his intention, when suddenly the Tushagun, with all his force, struck his knife into the chest of the shepherd. The Mongol fell, all covered with blood, a splash of which I noticed on the yellow silk of the llama's coat. What have you done? I exclaimed. Shh, be still, he whispered, turning to me his now quite blanched face. With a few strokes of the knife, he opened the chest of the Mongol, and I saw the man's lungs softly breathing and the distinct palpitations of the heart. The Lama touched these organs with his fingers, but no more blood appeared to flow, and the face of the shepherd was quite calm. He was lying with his eyes closed and appeared to be in deep and quiet sleep. As the Lama began to open his abdomen, I shut my eyes in fear and horror and when I opened them a little while later, I was still more dumbfounded at seeing the shepherd with his coat still open and his breast normal, quietly sleeping on his side. Tushagun Lama sitting peacefully by the brazier, smoking his pipe. If you'd like to listen to the rest of this recording and others, I've put them on Odyssey where there's no time limit. So please have a look on there, I've put the link down below. Take care.